Hello, this is Nathan Wood, pastor of North Dayton Baptist Church, and welcome to day 247 of the McShane Reading Plan. Glad you could join us. We are in 1 Samuel 28, 1 Corinthians 9, Ezekiel 7, and John 8. Some really precious scripture here today. Paul, in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 9, says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He's not just saying this because he's an apostle. He's not just saying this because he is an evangelist. He's not just saying this because he uh, was a great sinner and he has to make up a lot of lost, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of sin that he has committed. And so he owes God a lot more than all the rest of us know. This should be the cry of all of our hearts who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Woe unto us if we preach not the gospel. Now that doesn't mean you've got to go find a pulpit somewhere. That doesn't mean you've got to go find a sign placard and strap it to yourself with a bullhorn and go marching around a, a football stadium somewhere. It doesn't mean that you've got to uh, um, go to some foreign land. It doesn't mean any of those things. What it does mean is that you should have the gospel in your eyes and your ears, in your mouth, in your heart, in your mind. That should be what's coming out of you. It should be what's going into you and that which is going out of you. Um, we're supposed to be feasting on the Lord, on the word of the Lord. There's no coincidence that Jesus called himself, um, metaphorically speaking, bread and wine, taking him in, his sacrifice in. If we're feasting on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, or as the old song say, it says, the feasting on the manna of a bountiful supply. It's, um, it's going to follow that we speak his words. If we don't have his word coming in through our eyes and ears, if we don't have his word dwelling in our mind and in our heart, then it's not going to come out. Folks, and if, if you've got all that blessing inside of you, woe is you if, if you don't take it back out. Um, I don't want to go into a biology lesson, but if you do nothing but eat and drink and uh, nothing ever leaves you, you're going to be miserable. Miserable, miserable, miserable. It doesn't matter how good that meal was or how good that drink was. You're going to be miserable if all you do is take in good things. Not that the Word of God is going to poison you like rotting food in your gut, but you get the point. You've got, you got to get it out. So, the reward is that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So, um... His reward is the gospel itself. Now, he says that thou shalt not muzzle the, ox of the, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So, God takes care of the oxen. We're supposed to take care of the oxen. So, the workman's worth is higher. A full-time minister is worth a full-time pay. But it also says that a minister of the gospel should work for the gospel's sake in his own heart and in his own mind. That it's worth the relief and the blessing of preaching the Word of God. And that's very true. If you've got a preacher that's doing it for the money, um, then that, that's completely wrong. Um, they need to examine themselves or they need to find another line of work. Um, the preaching of the Gospel is a blessing within itself. And we're all called to preach the gospel in one way or the other, with our life and with our mouth. It, you know, honest to goodness, it's, it's part of salvation, is it not? Um, not that saying words in an incantation produces a magic spell by which you're saved, no. But if you believe in your heart, you're going to confess with your mouth. Or if you can't talk verbally, you will make it known that you believe. You will at least give testimony to the belief that you have, in whom you have believed. 
Um, and that's, frankly, that's a lot more than, praise the Lord, I'm saved. I walked the aisle and knelt on the mourner's bench and, and the preacher shook my hand and they dunked me in water and praise the Lord, I'm, I'm saved. Walking aisles, dunked in water, Grandpa Joe and, and Aunt Sally, and the good old time religion and dinner on the ground never saved anybody. As wonderful as that is, that's nothing more than a family reunion. What saves you is the blood of Jesus Christ. Trusting in Him, believing in your heart that He died for you, that He rose again, that He's the Lord of all creation, the God of the universe, who died for you and rose again. And telling people about it is how you prove that. My dear friend, if you can't recount the gospel that saved you, please examine whether or not you really know Jesus Christ as Savior. If you cannot, at the drop of a hat, give that account, please re-examine your salvation. You're not saved by quitting drinking. You're not saved by quitting smoking or quitting drugs. You're not saved by quitting sleeping with your neighbor's wife. You're not saved by straightening up your books and your tax re returns. You're not saved by uh, quitting this addiction or that addiction and straightening up your life and, and getting out of the gutter and getting cleaned up. You're not saved by good old time religion. You're not saved by running with the right circle of friends, even though right circle of friends can influence you in a good way. It's like the man who was relieved of a demon and his house was swept and garnished. Jesus called the religious people whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, but full of death and decay on the inside. Excuse me. We need to make sure. We need to make sure that the gospel is worth its own self in our lives. Professional ministry is a wonderful blessing. Um, but that's not why we do it. That's not why we do it. We do it because we love seeing people come into the fold. And we love to see the church edified by the Word of God. We love to see people light up with excitement over the Word of God. We love to see people light up with the truth of the gospel. It's wonderful. And we're not to act pretentious about it. Look at this, and he proceeds it with a few verses above that show the full extent. But verse 22, it says, For To the weak I am become as weak, that I may gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So Paul is aiming at everyone wanting to get some. He would love to get all, but his gospel is going out to everyone. And he's going to meet everyone where they are. Now, a lot of times we got to be care well, we got to be careful and measure our own lives and our own hearts. Obviously, we don't want to be charlatans. We don't want to be pretending to be something that we're not. But we don't want to be charlatans. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to fall into sin. But at the same time, we need to meet people where they are. Jesus met people where we are, where they were. The apostles, to a greater or lesser degree, met people where they were. Peter tried, but then he kept on reverting back to his good old habits of uh, being a Jew, which there's nothing wrong with being a Jew. It's a blessing. Uh, worshiping in a Messianic Shabbat is glorious. Um, observing the Feast of Israel, I've done a very poor job of doing that. Uh, Lauren and I did 
uh, light a um, light the lights of Hanukkah this year. But um, we're coming up very soon, a few days, on the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Israel. It's a real blessing. But you know, high holy days don't save us. But <laughs> or or get us lost. But you know. You want to celebrate Christmas with people who celebrate Christmas. You want to celebrate Hanukkah with people who celebrate Hanukkah. Get the picture. Weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. Um, go to ball games with people who like ball games. Uh, go to the opera with people who like the opera. Being a Renaissance man is, is a good thing in gospel ministry. Um, knowing a lot about a lot of things, or at least a little bit about a lot of things, helps. Um, gospel people are not so rooted in their own preferences that uh, they get testy about people dragging them out of their comfort zone. I'm guilty <laughs> of that. Um, but uh, I do try to be eclectic and meet people where they are, but you know, there are some things that are outside my comfort zone. But... Um, yeah, if, if we're a little too, uh, little too picky, that's not really a good gospel attitude. If we're a little too uh, finicky, that's not really a good gospel attitude. Um, again, there are certain things that are dead sinful against the scripture, um, but when it comes to uh, um, whether you, if you're, somebody you're trying to reach for the gospel likes to. Uh, likes to canoe and you don't really like boating, you better learn how to paddle. <laughs> I mean, that that's how it is. Um, at least that's the way I see it. Um, people love through relationship. I receive love through relationship. Meeting them where they are. Um, so, show up somebody where you care. All things to all men. Um, let's see, where do I want to go? I script, skipped over here. Um, oh, it, this is no more exemplified Jesus meeting somebody where they are when he sides with a woman taken in adultery. By the way, how'd they know? Were they watching? He writes their names on the earth, at least that's what I think he does. He writes on the earth. He says, with him who hath the first sin, cast the first stone. He doesn't excuse the woman's sin. But he's got looking out in the audience, and it's like, he knows. He knows, even if they were sinning as a part of this act, even by watching. Were they a participant? They're being tattletales. If there's pride in their heart being a tattletale, if they're seeking the death or the or the tripping up of the Son of Man, they're in sin. Let him who hath no sin cast the first stone. He eventually tells them that they are of their father the devil. Oh, that really gets them riled. They accused him of doing his miracles in the power of the Beelzebub. So, you know, you say, well, isn't that petty? They said, you know, they, they said, you're of the devil. And he said, no, you're of the devil. Well, the difference is Christ isn't being petty. Christ is being real. And what's scary here, folks, is that these religious Jews really thought that they were right. Many of them did anyway. Several of them should have known and were just arrogant. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life. Eternal life is in Jesus Christ alone. Follow the scriptures, not man's wisdom. Challenge your ideas. Challenge the ideas of those who f you follow. Be good Bereans. And it's interesting that, he, well, he calls the devil the father of lies, which he is. And we'll talk about that in a bit. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he... I am he, I am who? I am 
Verse 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Hayah, the name of God. That's how Jesus introduced himself to Moses in the burning bush. Yes, that was Jesus, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, who is the Lord himself, speaking from the bush that burned and was not consumed. Um, Lauren and I watched with Lydia <laughs> the um, movie that I hadn't seen in maybe a couple decades, uh, Prince of Egypt. Yeah, 98, 2008, 2018. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a long time. Um, But um, it's, a, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. I was glad to see it. I didn't realize Val Kilmer played Moses. Um, sadly lost his voice. Uh, famously played Doc Holliday, among other many good roles. But he, um, Moses, was introduced to God by the words, I am. That would have spoken volumes. Before Abraham was, I am. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. That's how God introduced him. I am. I am the God of your fathers. Same thing he told Moses. He's telling them, I am. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Never let anybody tell you. I've said this many times. Never let anybody tell you that Christ does not call himself God. This is one of those times, period. Somehow I've got... A, yeah, okay, never mind. I had two, two columns right next to each other. Um, anyway, trying to think. <laughs> okay, first Samuel. Now 28. Yeah. We'll hit this and then we'll be done. Very interesting and a very sad part of this story. There's one instance where there's a witch involved when God allows a soul to return. Witches cannot bring back loved ones. Do you hear what I said? Witches cannot bring back loved ones. They cannot bring back the dead. If they conjure anything, witches can conjure demons, fallen angels by summoning them. And that's only if they choose to be summoned. And if God allows them to be summoned. And perhaps they can impersonate another person. I don't... I don't know if they impersonate people they've never possessed. Perhaps they can. I don't know. God, God knows. Jesus knows that the devil is the father of lies. But there's only one instance in Scripture where somebody who is in Abraham's bosom actually comes back to life when there's a witch involved. All the rest of the time, whether it's Mount Transfiguration, excuse me, when Moses and Elijah are there, that's, this is the only time when there's a witch actually involved. And notice the witch at Endor is the witch at Endor is absolutely terrified when she sees this. She's not used to seeing the real thing. And Samuel chastises Saul for his sin once again. Let's not be like Saul and fall into grasping at straws to be reconciled to God in the world or in magic or in mysticism 
Folks, we don't have to find alternate means to God. We don't. Even if we think that we're going through the means of, um, of natural powers, witchcraft, I truly believe is real. Some people who claim to be witches really can't do it. Um, but there are some who, who really can. And it's terrifying. Um, we don't need to get a back door to talk to God or dead loved ones. This also tells me, this also tells me um, that uh, looking for the advice or the prayer, and I, I'm not trying to step on people's toes or make people offended, but Focusing on dead loved ones or dead respected ones to intercede for us is not of God. We may desire, I have a great desire to see my grandfather again. I miss his prayers, my grandmother's prayers. I miss um, those who have gone before me. But it's not Herman Wood or Bernice Wood that's making intercession for me before the Father. I have a direct, direct line through Jesus Christ. I don't need the prayers of the saints. And if I could bring back Herman Wood from the grave right now, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Unless for some odd reason God chose to, to let me see him for some reason. I, I, I've, he's allowed me to dream of loved ones gone before, my grandfather included. That's a precious dream. But um, if it were my will, I wouldn't bring him back, not into this sinful world. Um, witchcraft and magic are not to be dabbled with. Witches are really startled when they see the real power of God. Let's not be like Saul and seek alternate means to to reconcile ourselves. Let's not go in through the back door like a thief or a robber. Let's not try to invoke rites and rituals in this world to try and reach the Lord. You're not going to do it. It's like the Tower of Babel. It's like the Tower of Babel. Oh, folks. Let's believe the Gospel and trust in the one who sits on the throne. The son of David. Saul could have trusted in the son of David, but he chose to grasp at straws and to the point where he fell into even deeper and deeper and deeper sin. And we're going to see the depth of his folly finally coming up. Don't go there. Don't hang on to mysticism. Hide the Word of God in your heart and speak it to others. Whether you're on top or whether you're on the bottom or somewhere in the middle, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because it's all of our jobs. We love you. Have a good day.